Good morning to you. It's a privilege to be here. Man, the Cross family has had a rough couple of weeks. Liam, a couple of weeks ago, got sick with the upper respiratory stuff and had to take him to the emergency room. And then my wife got it, Brittany, and then now I have it. And uh, golly, it is relentless, you know? It is just killing me. So I say that to warn you that I may cough a couple times and just... Uh, I ask for your forgiveness in advance uh, before we get started. So, but I am happy to be here and uh, looking forward to talking about God's Word this morning. Let's pray as we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do come to you this morning thankful. Thankful, Father, for your love. Thankful for your forgiveness. Father, thankful for the grace that we have in you. Lord, I pray that you would be with us this morning. That you would encourage us and help us. And Father, that you would give us the strength to continue on in our faith. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Well, as Dwayne mentioned just a few minutes ago, it is Palm Sunday. And on Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem with a great witness or with a great many witnesses before him. And as he was coming in, and we're not going to focus on the story, but I just wanted to kind of highlight this. As he was coming into Jerusalem, People were standing around and they were cheering and they were saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they, they kept on peace and blessedness and blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The interesting thing about that statement is that all of those people that were standing there yelling, blessed be the name of, of the Lord, blessed be the king who comes in the name of the Lord. I don't think they really understood what was happening. They didn't understand exactly what was about to happen. See, on Friday, Jesus, uh, or on that Sunday, Jesus comes in into Jerusalem, and then a week later, he's going to be offered as a sacrifice. And they don't understand that. They see him as the king, and they say, Blessed is the king who comes. Now, there's an interesting, uh, we can get a couple interesting things from that. One is that they didn't understand who Jesus Christ was and what his mission was. And two, they didn't understand their condition. They didn't understand the necessity of the cross, right? They didn't understand the importance of a sacrifice for them. Now, we're going to celebrate the Passover uh, feast tonight uh, at, in the gym, and we would love for you to come and join us for that. And what we're doing is we're celebrating the fact that we have a sacrifice for us that no one can ever match. We have the ultimate sacrifice. And, and we pick up on that from the Old Testament idea of what the sacrifice is. So we know that right before the Jews left Egypt, uh, they, uh, God told them, I want you to sacrifice an unblemished lamb. No spots, no problems, nothing wrong with this lamb. Totally perfect, completely perfect. And they had to sacrifice this lamb. And then they put the blood over the doorways. Now, a lot of us know that story. But what it tells us is that we have to have something in our place for God to see us the way he needs to see us, right? We have to have something in our place for God to see us the way that we need to be seen by God in order to have a relationship with him. Well, that's exactly what Jesus came to do when he was walking into Jerusalem. And the people did not get it. And I think that even us today, that we struggle with that too. That we forget about the necessity of the cross. Why in the world did Jesus die on the cross? Why did he? I mean, we, we begin to think, there, there had to have been an easier way. I mean, Jesus could have marched into Jerusalem. He could have become king. He could have wiped out everybody. And it would have been perfect and fine. And there would have been no problems. Jesus would have reigned. We would have followed him. And it would have gone well. I don't know. But this is the way that God chose to do it. And God told Jesus, go into Jerusalem. Take up your cross and follow me. And he did. To the point of dying on the cross for us. Well, I think one of the mentality or the, the one of the struggles that we have for us today 
is that we forget about the need and the necessity for the cross because we think, I'm really not that bad. I'm really not that bad off. And what happens when we begin to think that way is we forget about the holiness of God. We lose sight of the perfection of God, the perfection that we will never be able to meet, the perfection that we will never be able to see, but the perfection that we need in order to have a relationship with Him. So we forget about that perfection. So we begin to think, you know, I mean, I've done a lot of good things in my life. I, I serve at church. I, I, I volunteer in this. I, whenever they need somebody to volunteer on the spot, man, I'll show up and I'll raise my hand and I'm there. Or I'll, I'll help my neighbor even when they didn't ask me to help. I'm pretty good. I'm a pretty good person. And I've done a lot of good things. I don't really deserve a lot of the negative things that have happened to me. Right? Or we can suffer from the mentality of, well, I can earn it. I can earn the position that I need with God, right? I'll work in order to earn that right. I mean, that's the way a lot of us are raised, especially as Americans, right? That's an American mentality. By golly, I'm going to work. I'll work hard. I'll do it. I'll conquer it. I'll accomplish it. And then I'll stand up before everybody and say, look, I did it. I'm proud, right? We struggle from that. So we, we begin to want to earn it. Or we begin to think that we're, we're good. We haven't really done that many bad things. Or I do all the right things. I rarely mess up. I really don't make that many mistakes. Right? Some of us struggle with that mentality. I've, I've done that before where I've thought, wait, wait I've, I've done really good here. I haven't, I haven't messed up at all. Like, I think my marriage is perfect. Just kidding. Uh, I, I think that I don't mess up very much at all, right? And we begin to struggle with some of these different mentalities. Now, some of you are saying, no, wait a minute. I, I know that I needed Christ to die for me. I understand that. And that's good. But you have to admit that there are times when those mentalities kind of creep into your mind. And you begin to think... God, I, I'm doing pretty good here. I've got it figured out. I'm doing the right things. God, if you'll just give me the chance to try one more time, I'll earn it. I promise I'll do it right this time. But we forget the fact that we just aren't good enough. We just can't earn it. There is nothing we can do to put ourselves in the right position with God. There is absolutely nothing we can do to put ourselves in the right position before God. That is the truth. And the minute we begin to forget that, we begin, the enemy begins to creep in and corrupt our own thoughts. If you don't believe me, turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. And we're going to look in Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. And we're going to see that the, that the Galatians struggled with this as well. Before we get started there, I want to give you an illustration. A long time ago, there was a TV show on um, that I don't know if any of you have seen this. I only saw maybe one or two episodes. And I think it was on one of those channels that, you know, it's not one of the main channels. But anyways, the show was called Joes versus Pros or Pros versus Joes or something like that. Anyway... Uh, when I first saw this show, I, I laughed. I mean, it was really funny because you had these guys, you have these older guys that they played football or they played basketball or they ran track or they did some sport or something like that in high school. And man, they were good. Like they, they were the best on the team. They were the best in the county. They were the best in the state, but they never went anywhere with it. You know what I'm saying? So, so they were really good in their own head, but they just didn't get that far with it. And those were the Joes. And then you have them versus the pros. So, so the TV show was, okay, okay, yeah, you, you did. Yeah, you were kind of good at one point. Yeah, you played football. Okay, you were running back, and you were pretty good. And, yeah, you got some yardage, and you scored some touchdowns. And, yeah, you were pretty good. But you weren't really that good, you know. You, you, weren't, you didn't make it to the next level, right? So in their mind, they think, but I could have. If I would have just, you know, I, I could have gone. I could have gone really far. But we all know that they couldn't have, right? So then they go on this TV show, and, and they're the Joes, and it's versus the pros. Then you have former pro athletes 
who are legitimate, actual, well-respected, awesome athletes, and then they go head to head. So then you have you have this guy. He goes in. He gets all fired up. He gets suits up, suited up, puts on you know all the gear for you know if he's playing football or whatever it is. And then you have the pro athlete who's who's like a middle linebacker, uh, who's just professional, awesome, had all these stats in the NFL and all this kind of stuff, and then they go head to head. And of course, the only, I think one of the shows that I watched, one of them was, this guy comes out and he's just, he thinks he's gonna wear it out. And he goes out there and runs right down the middle and this linebacker hits him and it, I think it separated something in his neck, I don't remember. But he just laid there on the ground and the show stopped, you know, goes to commercial break, then they come back and it's like, well, so-and-so had to get carted off because he fractured a, something in his neck. I don't remember what it was. It didn't paralyze him, but it hurt him really bad. And that was one hit. It was just one hit. But when I saw that and when I was thinking about this message, I thought, you know, that's, that's how I think some of the times when it comes to my spiritual life. When it comes to my relationship with Christ, I think, I got this, man. I don't need any help. I got it. I'm good. And then I step up and I compare myself with Christ and who he is and what he did and how he did it. And I think, ooh, I'm in desperate need. I'm in a desperate position. Well, in Galatians, they're struggling with the same thing. And Paul writes to the Galatians. And look where he starts. In verse 3, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself, he starts right with the very heart of the matter, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul starts with the very essence of the gospel message. The very need for the cross. The necessity for the cross. He says grace and peace to you from God our Father. Why? Because He sent the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ gave Himself for you. He was the unblemished Lamb. He was the sacrifice that no, that no one else could be. He was God in the flesh. He was God in the in spirit. He was, he was fully God and fully man. And He came on our behalf to die for us. Well, look, the Galatians are struggling with something. And the Galatians are struggling with the fact that they're being enticed by another gospel message. Just like we tend to be enticed by another gospel message. And when we are, and when we give in to that, we decrease the need for the cross, don't we? When we begin to think, hey, I'm doing a pretty good job. Lord, I, I, I've kind of got this thing figured out. Or when we begin to think, Lord, if you'll just give me another chance and I'll earn it, I'll do it better. I can earn this good life that you're promising. We decrease the need for the cross. We decrease the need for what Jesus came to do. So look, look in verse 6. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Now the gospel that the Galatians were struggling with was the gospel of circumcision. They had had many people come in and say, well, if you aren't circumcised, you're not, going, you're not right with God. But we have, that same, we have those same messages in our heads today. Maybe not about circumcision, but it's about all kinds of different things. It could be that, that uh, if we continue... Uh, doing the right thing, if we continue going to church, then, then God is going to look at that over time and say, all right, you're in. Good job. Or if we continue serving our family the way that we feel like is the right way to do it, then, okay, God will have grace. All right, you're in. Good job. Or if we continue working hard at our jobs and we do all the right things, we don't steal any money, we don't steal any printer paper, we don't steal any post-it notes, we don't do anything but we do all the right things, then okay, God, God's going to let us in. That's a different gospel than what Jesus Christ presented. The gospel that Jesus Christ presented was believe that I am God. That's it. It's so simple, it's ridiculous. Believe that I am Jesus Christ and Lord. In verse 7 he says, Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you 
and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Have any of you ever been challenged on what the gospel really is? I can remember <coughs> one time I was working a part-time job at Kroger's in high school. And I was living in Knoxville. And uh, I would go to work after school. I'd bag groceries and talk to different customers. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty laid-back job. And one day there was a new guy that was hired on. And he, he bagged groceries. And we started talking. And, man, I was really outgoing with my faith. I wanted to tell people about Christ. I wanted to tell people about church and where I went to church and invite them. And I was excited. And I remember talking with this guy and saying, hey, man, you go to church anywhere? You knew? You knew in town? Or... Where'd you go? Oh, no, I've been here for a while. Oh, you go to church anywhere? Yeah, yeah. And he told me the name of the church where he went. And, uh, and I said, oh, okay, well, yeah, man, I just want to tell you uh, that our church, you know, told me about our church and the different things going on, told me about uh, my relationship with Christ. And, and he said, after I told him about my relationship with Christ, he said, well, well I don't, you don't sound like you're a Christian. And I said, what? I'm a Christian. I know I'm a Christian. And he said, no, no, it you, you left out something. Well, what do you mean? I didn't leave out anything. I, I know that Jesus Christ, he, you know, he came for me, he died for me, and he rose again for me, and I believe in him. I believe in God. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in, in the Trinity. I, you know, what, what, what do you mean? Well, you, you never, you didn't say that you got baptized and, and right afterwards. And because you didn't get baptized, now you're not, you're not a Christian, Right? It's like, whoa, wait a minute. What are you talking about? And he said, well, if you, don't have, if you died right now and, and, you, and, and you haven't been baptized, and I have been baptized, but he said, if you died right now, then you wouldn't go to heaven. And I said, no, that's not it, man. You, somebody's told you something wrong. That's the wrong message. But that's not the message of Jesus Christ. The message of Jesus Christ is by faith. By faith we believe that he is Lord. By faith, we believe that he died on the cross. By faith, we believe that he rose again for us, for you, for whoever wants to receive it. But he argued with me for days, for days and days and days that I was not a Christian. So, man, I started digging into everything I could possibly find. Is baptism necessary for salvation? Oh, my gosh, what's it? And no, it wasn't. Anyways, what I'm illustrating is this. If you're not careful... You will encounter people that try to add to or deduct from by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And if you're not careful, you'll get pulled off track. It can happen. It really can happen. That's what's happening here with the Galatians. When he says, there are some who trouble you and went and want to distort, distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And he says, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. What is this gospel message that Paul's reminding them of? I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm just going to read this to you. You don't have to turn there if you want to. But I want to tell you about the gospel message that Paul was talking about when he was referencing this to the Galatians. In chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, it says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and which you stand. And by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And this is what he says, verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Verse 4. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, who was Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I have persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me is not 
in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. That's the gospel message. That Jesus Christ came for us. That he died for us. He was the unblemished lamb. He was the perfect sacrifice. He was the substitute that you and I needed for us to be in a relationship with God. Without him, we have nothing. Really. Without him, we have absolutely nothing. Without his life, without his death, without his sacrifice, without his resurrection, we have nothing. So when we talk about this week and the things happening this week, we need to remember that if it wasn't for the cross, we would have nothing and we would go nowhere. We have nothing to hope and nothing to look forward to. When we talk about the unblemished lamb that we're going to celebrate tonight, and we can think about the perfect life, death, sacrifice, and resurrection of the risen lamb, we have hope in that. Without that, we have nothing. I want to give you, if you want to take these down, I want to give you nine steps to keeping the gospel clear. If you don't have a pen, that's fine. You can just listen. But I'm just going to walk through these pretty quick. These are the nine steps for keeping the gospel clear. That we have to remember this. One, God is holy and without sin. In order for us to understand the gospel, it starts with that. In order for us to understand the need for the cross, the necessity of the cross, we have to understand first that God is holy and He is without sin. 1 Peter 1, 5, or 1, 15 through 16 says, But as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. God is absolutely holy. He is holy, and we cannot be in relationship with Him without a holy sacrifice. Number two, God made the world and us good. Genesis 1.31 And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, and the sixth day. God made everything, and it was intended as good. It was. And we were good at one point. We were really good. The problem happened when we rebelled against God. So this is number three. We rebelled against God. You can read about it in Genesis 1, or Genesis 3, 1 through 7, or I'm just going to quickly read Romans 5, 12. It says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because of all sin. We rebelled against God. The problem of evil is not God. It's us. Right? So we have a holy God that we've separated ourselves from. We're in desperate need now. Number four is that we are sinful. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you ever want a definition of sin, it's Romans 3.23. When you try to measure up and you think, God, aren't I good enough? Does it measure up with the glory of God? Because all have fallen short of the glory of God. That's a good definition of sin. Uh, number five is sin results in death. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Number, number six is Jesus is sinless. 1 Peter 2.22 says this, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And then number seven is this. Jesus became our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake He made Him to be, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. In Christ we become the righteousness of God. And number eight is this. Jesus died for us. 1 Corinthians 15.3 says, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. We just read that. And then number nine is this, and we forget about this one. Number nine is this, that Jesus rose again. He conquered death. That's a beautiful thing. 1 Corinthians 15.20 says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, 
the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. We have to remember that the, that the cross is an absolute necessity for us. And if we forget about that, then we've lost sight of the real Christian message. Wouldn't you agree? In Acts 16.30, this is what's important for you to know today. There's a man who said, what should I do to be saved? And in Acts 16.30, I'm going to read it for you. It says, then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said to him, believe in the Lord and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe in the Lord. Isn't it so simple, yet so complex? Believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's it. That's the cross. It presents us with the option to believe and to be in a right, in, in a right relationship with God. That is what the cross does for us. So I want to encourage you this week. Obviously, if you have not come to a point in your life where you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then you need to make that decision. You need to make it sometime very soon. But for those of us who do believe, this week is a time for us to remember what happened. That the perfect person came in our place. That the perfect substitute who did not deserve it came for us. He came for me. He came for you. And you don't deserve it. And he did what no one else could do. And he paid the price that you could not pay. And he rose again. And he's waiting to meet you. If you will choose to believe in him. So I want to encourage you. Take some time this week to remember. Remember the cross. And if you do not know him, choose to believe. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. What would we look like as a church if we truly understood the grace that we live in? We'd probably be more forgiving, wouldn't we? We'd probably be more patient. We'd probably be more accommodating. And we'd probably be a lot more loving. I want to encourage you this week to remember the cross. I'm so mad that I'm sick because this is one of the most wonderful times of the year and I want to enjoy it. Enjoy this time of the year. Remember the cross this week and look forward to it. Let's pray.